Um, thank you so much for, for coming to um, the first of the year of our Arctic Environmental Humanities workshop. This is a series that um, Michael Bravo and I have um, started since last autumn. Michael Bravo is at the Scott Polar Research Institute at Cambridge University, my co-conspirator over here. And I'm Adriana Krachun at Boston University at the Party Center for the Study of the Longer Range Future. So today, um, we're thrilled to have with us Renelta Arluk, who will be our speaker today. Um, Renelta is the Director of Indigenous Arts at Banff Center for the Arts and Creativity, where she designs all the Indigenous Arts-led programming across all arts disciplines. Mm -hmm. um, she was the first Inuk and the first Indigenous woman to direct at the Stratford Festival in Ontario, where she won an award for her direction, which is awesome. She founded the Akpik Theatre in 2008, which is the only professional Indigenous theatre company in the Northwest Territories. Um, the Akpik Theatre has created numerous works, including the Pawakan Macbeth, set in the late 1800s on Plains Cree territory, which I so wish I could see someday, somehow. Um, Renata is Unavialuit, Cree, and Dene from the Northwest Territories herself, where she grew up as a child on the trap line. I think an experience that will plays a role in her art and her curating. Her talk today is Ataramik, which means always. And we're so thrilled to have you, Renata. Welcome. Masi Choku Yannick for having me today. I'm very grateful to be here. I come to you from Treaty 7 Territory in Banff, Alberta, Canada. So Treaty 7 Territory is the home of the Stony Nakoda, the Blackfoot, uh, Blackfoot Sutuna Vedene, and Métis Region 3, as well as uh, traveling and trading and nations of Cree and Tanaha. And um, I'm originally from the Northwest Territories, and so I just want to say Ublami, which is good morning, and Atira, hello, and Atitu, my name is Renalta Arluk. <clears throat> I'm really grateful, and um, I, I keep a room a little, a uh, little, um, I will be doing a PowerPoint presentation. I'll show some videos, because when we talk about the Arctic, uh, one thing that, you know, we all get really compelled by is the land itself. And so I thought rather than talking about the land and showing you pictures, I'd share with you language and uh, imagery uh, that goes with it. And so we'll kind of break out the videos um, with a little bit of chatter in between. The um, first video I'm going to show you, which is always how I like to start, is with language. So you're going to hear a story uh, told to me by my great aunt Lillian Elias, who's a matriarch in our uh, Nuvialuit, uh, in my Nuvialuit side of my family. She's one of the last uh, remaining um, fluent, fluent Nuvialuit uh, dialect speakers. And, um, and uh, she's just a beautiful lady to watch. And so I'm just gonna share that with you. Yes, yes, got that. Can you see that? Great. Can you hear that? Ilokata, <laughs> Ara <laughs> Tama <laughs> Kilalua Homing 
Tahu cikun hawa hukuru ne kuat dai mana? Kehi mikti wala ne kuat. Aganat ki hawa waktu ne kuat. Angutis kelia luki akhirnya kuting kelia luar ne akhirnya kuting bihun ne kuat. Ahen aganat mat kuat. Hawa guni kengat kelia luki kelia luki kat hawa guni kengat. Kehi cawa mungkin mera ama kuting pi pi mana? Ama aku tu, kejaluk kita, kejaluk kita kerak tu bilang it, pipi raka kami, muna kerai nyami, miluk tu cewur ke, miluk tu cewur old, tapi tak nak, ini ni aku tiga le, kalau lagi ya. So I look, and I. So that's um, my great aunt Lillian Elias. And what she's talking about is when women would go to the whale camp. So in July, which tends to be the time that, um, <clears throat> that uh, uh, would be the time that our families would go to the camps and, and go beluga whale hunting. Now this is a practice that still continues. And what I was there is part of a reality series called Dene A Journey, which I'll show you the clip for next. And Dene A Journey was an uh, indigenous, um, led a reality series which took an urban indigenous people and brought them into their home territory with language and immersed them in language and culture to kind of connect the the traditional with the contemporary within us and so i was part of the season two episode one and i was able to go to kendall island so kendall island is very far on the edge in the northwest territory so northwest territories is uh got 11 official languages, uh, nine of them indigenous, uh, made up of Dene, Cree, Inuit, and um, Western Arctic. And in that area, to get to Kendall Island from Inuvik, so Inuvik is one of the remote communities there, you take a four and a half hour boat ride on a Lund boat up to the little tip there. And there's bushes no higher than your knees. It's quite barren land next to the Arctic Ocean. And the Arctic Ocean is beautiful. and and in July, it's a good time. That's when the beluga are um, mi uh, migrating in that area. And so what, uh, because it was my first time, that was a story that and my aunt goes every summer. So she just shared that story with me and, uh, and really wanted to talk about the language and, and, and her role in it. And so what I'll show you is, uh, I'll show you the um, next little clip. Born in Fort Smith, Northwest Territories. I'm very familiar with the Dene side of me, but the Inuit side of me, I guess it never got explored as much. We never used to let the woman in the hunting boat just because it's so dangerous. We've been on a boat in the hunting whale. Because I don't think it's good enough to just say it's because it's a woman's job or this is a man's job. I believe that's good enough. This land, we had to both survive on it. Seems that outsiders are always coming in and uh, trying to take stuff away from us, like our hunting rights. I'm just hoping, I'm hoping Abel brings me back a whale. I really thought it was amazing that she said, I don't like to say, I think of our language as dying, but that our language is sleeping. So there's a lot in there, because it's a trailer. So there's a lot of talking about women's roles, men's roles, uh, being pressured from outside, so uh, outside pressure to discontinue our, our, uh, our cultural practice because it, it doesn't align with uh, other value systems. And so there's a lot in there and it was a pretty interesting um, episode in itself. But really what I wanted to show you is I just wanted to show you the land and I wanted to show you the water and I wanted you to see how, uh, in, how we interact with the land and water in a very, uh, in a, in, you know, in a very natural way and, um, and, uh, and that it, it's not, it's uh, sometimes you can get disconnected from it. So then there's these wonderful access points and finding ways to, to connect. 
So this is where I'll open it up for a little bit of conversation, like what you've seen so far, what you've seen, and then uh, we can move forward to like the next, uh, the next couple of videos. But is there any questions that anyone has now? Yeah, it's a wonderful, before. wonderful uh, metaphor of, of language sleeping. Maybe it's not a metaphor, but it, um, it suggests that this is a story ahead about awakening. Yeah, and it's, I think that's really important to talk about. And I think that's why my aunt is so inspiring is that, you know, we, from an anthropological perspective or just from a colonial perspective, you know, we are very disconnected from language. I myself don't speak my language and I don't speak my language because my, because of the familial connection, uh, disconnection from residential school and from day home. So prior to residential school, um, there was something called day homes, which is something that my grandmother went to. And then my mother is a residential school survivor. And I know, uh, for those who don't know, but residential school was a was a form of genocide or colonization that was done by the church and the government of Canada to disconnect indigenous people from their community. And they really focused on children because children are the center core of, of any co uh, indigenous cosmology. And so if you take the child from the place, what that what happened from that is you disconnect from uh, parent, you, you disconnect from your language, from your ways of living, and then you disconnect. And then the next generation, which was my mother's generation, is you disconnect from how to parent. And so when we talk about how I was raised on the trap line by my grandparents, the, it's very natural that the oldest child do, does spend time with their grandparents to learn those teachings and have them passed down. Um, but specifically for this one, it was my mom was a very young parent. She's 17 years old when she had me, my father as well. And my mother just wanted to get her education. And my grandparents were prospectors and trappers on the land. And so they were in a place where they could take me and, and help me um, and raise me while my mom went and got her education. And so she did. She, she got her education and, um, and she's kind of an incredible woman in her own right. And, uh, and has had to learn a lot through her own living because of that disconnection. And so the, if we looked at language as dying, then it doesn't give us hope to think that we're going to survive or that we can't resurge uh, who we are and our connection to who we are. And so it's beautiful that this you know 70 something year old elder is saying, I, I still have hope for for my for my relatives i still have hope for my younger generations by saying this language is sleeping it's really great i'll jump into the next video but i'll i'll give some context there so i am an artist i'm a theater um theater uh practitioner i write i direct i produce i act i story tell and uh from that experience you know, we were on that uh, island for five days. Um, it's a very small island. And with what was kind of beautiful about that experience was that the CB radio played a really big part. So there was another camp that was on the other side of the island. And the CB radios, they would talk to each other and they would say, do you see any whale? Do you see any whale? And they communicated with each other. The particulars of whale hunting is is very um, very specific, which is the water has to, to the water has to flow a certain way, not directionally, but if there's a lot of uh, white caps, because beluga are white, it's not an optimal time to whale hunt, and so the water had to be a certain time, the light had to be a certain way, and uh, and and so you're. So the CB radios were going back and forth all the time. And then when one saw a whale, the men would get on the boat and they would take off and they would go and then they would come back, there'd be no whale. And this happened several times during our time there to the point where you just saw me sitting on the edge wondering if they were going to get a whale. And so I called my, I created a performance art piece called Anticipation and Anticipation is waiting for a whale. But it was also in response to climate change. And so um, they did get a whale, which was very exciting. And, and what I was very surprised by and taken aback by was that when the whale arrived to the land, we couldn't touch it. 
we couldn't touch it because um, scientists had to come and do tests on it before we were able to harvest it. And I thought that that was a, uh, I was very curious as to why that was the practice. You know, I also wondered where they came from because it took us four and a half hours to get there. And then 15 minutes later, this boat arrives with all these, um, all these scientists on them. So I was like, where were they hanging out? Uh, when they arrived, they take the jaw of the beluga and they do that to test the age of the beluga through the teeth. And then they get the hunter to open up the beluga and they take a portion of every organ and they do blood, blood testing. And, uh, and then they, they do the blood testing there on the spot. So they have these, um, therm these uh, coolers full of all their, all their testing material. And there's this one uh, woman, she was kind of leading it. Uh, she's South Asian. And I was chatting with her and I asked her, like, what was the practice of what was happening? And she said, oh, you know, I've been doing this for five years. Uh, we do a test of the beluga uh, every season. And I said, in the five years that you've been doing this, what have been some of your discoveries? And she said, well, the population is strong. The migration is strong. Uh, the health of the belugas themselves are healthy. Everything is, they're, they're, uh, they're, they're a thriving, thriving um, uh, species. She goes, but what I have noticed is that the blubber is getting thinner. And I said, okay, like thinner. And she said, yes. So even though they're still able to dive to the depths that they're diving, the, the blubber itself is getting thinner. And I said, why do you think that that is happening? And she said, it's because the species of the fish that they're eating is less fatty. And so what that tells me is that the water is getting warmer and, and species of fish that are more southbound are making their way north. And that, those, and that the migration um, paths of the beluga are, are, the, are the same, but they're eating the fish that are now in their path. And, and that is the impacting the thinness of their blubber. And that's climate change. And when we think about climate change, uh, you know, we think really big and it's a bit overwhelming because it's so, it's so slow moving yet very um, impending. And uh, when we talk about the Arctic, there's a lot of different, Arctic is the response to climate change. It is the impact of climate change. And, and for our camp on Kendall Island, that was our impact of climate change. So I created a performance art piece called Anticipation. And in the, the premise of it is it's a camp and I'm just there waiting and doing practice, like the things that everyone else did for the five days that we were there, drinking coffee, rolling your cigarettes, smoking your cigarettes, you know, checking in the weather, listening to the CB radio, um, and just looking out onto the water to see if the men come back with whale. And uh, so what you're going to hear is you're going to hear two sounds. One is the CB radio, but also the radio station. So radio stations are a really big deal in the North. Uh, I was raised with CBC radio. And, uh, and so you'll listen to um, these wonderful interactions. And then it's just, and what I'm doing is I'm cutting fake blubber, but it's uh, soaked in oil. And I'm cutting the blubber thinner and thinner and hanging it. So as the performance art piece extends, you just start seeing thinner and thinner pieces of blubber with oil dripping, dripping off of it. I'm 
Our piece. We did it in a few different places. Um, Akpik Theater is the theater company that I founded. And Akpik is my uh, Inuk name given to me by my great grandmother, uh, Alice Simon. And Akpik is cloudberry. So it's the cloudberry that grows on the barren lands in all across uh, the circumpolar north. You can actually buy Akpik jam at IKEA uh, because. Uh, Ikea sells because those berries grow in their area as well. And so it's a little treat to kind of be like, ah, these are Akpik. So they kind of look like a peach raspberry in a way. There's uh, multiple, like the little segments that grow together. It's, um, it grows very low on the, low on the ground. And so it has a, has an earth flavor to it. So it's a super sweet berry, but it tastes really good in jam, jellies, and uh, every now and then, I just eat it uh, cold with some sugar on it, and it's quite a treat. And uh, and so that was one of the productions that Act Peak Theater uh, produced, and we did it in Yellowknife. So what you're seeing it there is you're seeing it in the lobby at the Northern Arts and Cultural Center in Yellowknife, North Coast Territories. And it also was at, uh, done at the Theater Center in Toronto, <laughs> Um, in a space there when they were just opening up their new theater space. And so I, I was with Seasick. Uh, with Alana Mitchell. So both of our pieces were in response to climate change in some capacity. And at the end of that, I had little chunks of muktuk that I passed out to the, to the um, audience so that they could try it. Um, a couple of things I wanted to mention there was what you're listening to is those requests and those, and those, those were coming in from Barrel, Alaska. It's a radio station that you can live stream. And uh, that's just a very natural way of when we wish happy birthday, like every relative in your family in the house has to wish happy birthday to that same person. And then multiple households will say happy birthday to that one person whose birthday it is. It's a practice that still happens with those, with our local radio stations. And it's something that brings me a lot of joy. So I was happy to have that in there. Um, and I just want to acknowledge that the videos that you're seeing were done by Amos Scott, who is a producer of Dene A Journey. And so that uh, was my, my great aunt and uh, he actually archived, videoed um, that video for me. And uh, Terrence Houle is quite a well-known performance artist. He's Blackfoot from this, from this territory that I'm in right now. Uh, yeah, so we can take some, open up some questions because we're getting near the end. I have one more video. Maybe I could ask you a question to keep, there's so, a lot of things I'd love to ask you, Rinalda. It's too good to pass up the opportunity to ask you about the soundscape and, and a little bit more about the radio. And uh, I had no idea that you'd be getting community radio from, say, a, a Barrow rather than a Klavik. Or, um, I just wondered if you could tell us a little bit more about what it's like to hear the conversations in the background, the way you mix, mix that in and kind of the directions of communication. They're receiving from Barrow, but I don't know if they're receiving from you, but there's a lot of layering in there and it's very, very fascinating. Thanks. I'd love to talk about it. Yeah. So that when we talk about like Alaska, it surprised me, you know, 
as well because um the they got a signal to burrow alaska that was stronger than the signal to to uh, anuvik and mm. and i and so i was like oh that's really surprising but i guess not in some ways because alaska is just right there um and historically like on my inuvialuit side um we're from alaska we migrated from alaska into uh, the western arctic so in our family lineage there were three brothers in the late 1800s that went by dog team from alaska into into a, a Klavik inuvik region and two stayed and then one went back and so that they often went migrated like uh, traveled back and forth and so it took me by surprise too, but then when I was thinking about it, I was like, well, I guess it's not that surprising. They're right there. And so that radio is pretty much on when people wake up in the morning, like they all slept in a big, a big cabin that they've had, they've built. It's very, uh, very well laid out and um, very hospitable. And then we slept, uh, all five of us, like like this in a, in their wooden tent frame. So they were generous enough to mm -hmm. give us a tent frame to sleep in. And Pablo, one of the other filmmakers, brought his own tent. Smart, smart person. And so we're all like sleeping like this, mm -hmm. with of course one very loud snorey person, and uh, and and then they slept in the in their uh, larger cabin. And so when the morning they would set up the Coleman stove and they would take their coffee, and then the radio would go on, and that radio would stay on mm -hmm. all day, and you just hear Barrow, Alaska. And then the CB radio was the other thing that was on. And that was on the entire time because of the way that they were communicating with the other camp around them. So they really relied heavily on, on those two pieces of sound. And then behind me, which uh, wasn't captured, as I did a time lapse of the sun rising and the sun setting, but the sun never really sets. And, uh, and so it's just like this little, uh, it's just like this little slow time lapse of the sun just going like this. Mm -hmm. for the full half hour uh, of the performance art piece and th that's something to really recognize is that in the July it's 24-hour daylight and it's quite a powerful thing to witness so close to like to be right on the Arctic Ocean mm -hmm. and witnessing 24-hour daylight. Thank you. I have a quick question um, about anticipation. I was so interested in this and um, my question is, there's a long and um, controversial, painful history of um, Indigenous people being um, sort of imposed upon to perform indigeneity, as, as, as many people here know. So can you say a bit about how you, your how you dealt with that or how you what your thinking on that was as you were as you're working on your art is that did that impact how you were um your practice in any way that's a great question um <clears throat> so the the mandate of Agpig theater is to present create produce inspire and mentor northern indigenous art and northern slash indigenous so northern focused or indigenous focused and northern indigenous focused just to kind of and um and i and and from that groundwork is how all my work gets created is that it all comes from that place uh that honors and recognizes that mandate that we abide by and the other thing that active theater does that's very uh important is community engagement and so I, every work that ACPIC Theatre has done has always been connected to community and accountability to community. What that allows is accountability. So one of my first pieces I created was two mid, which is tracks in an octopus. And it's about breaking generational cycles. And it's a one woman show, multi-character, you know, the, the, the standard when you're starting out as an actor and you're trying to like uh, find out who you are, what your artistic practice is. And I performed it um, in Yellowknife first. And that's kind of where all my work grows from is that it has to have that indigenous northern connection first, community and connection. And so when I performed it, afterwards we did a Q&A and I really wanted to get their feedback. And the first thing I asked them, as I said, is this a northern play? And the audience responded, yes, it is a northern play. And I said, is this an indigenous play? And uh, the audience responded, yes, this is an indigenous play. 
and I'm Northern and I'm Indigenous and I feel pretty confident in both of those things. But when you're, when you're doing this kind of work, it isn't siloed with just you. Yes, you're the inspiration. Yes, you're the builder. But to be able to confidently go down South, this is my, my thinking is to be able to go down South and say, this is a Northern Indigenous play. I need my community to agree with me. Yes, that's a Northern Indigenous play. And when you have disagreements, that's fine too. It's not the, it isn't the check mark that says, yes, this is that. But it just gave me the confidence to be able to go into different communities and say, my community and I, to say this is a Northern Indigenous play. And, and that's really that accountability is really, really important. Because, you know, the Arctic is a very inspiring place. Many people have written about it. Many people have studied it and will continue to study it. And but often it comes with a, a bit of a parachuting in, extracting knowledge, and then leaving to further your practice. And that happens in all communities, arts communities as well. We get inspired. And my way of, of practice with acting theater and just who I am as an artist is, but where can we offer reciprocity? Where can we offer a greater platform? How can we ensure that we're holding these stories safe, safely? And, and, and responsibly. And so that's, and so with, um, as far as the indigenous, and, and what that does is when you look at anticipation, it's not a pan-indigenous idea. It's not just I had this idea. It really came from somewhere very real, got interpreted through the lens of the artist, myself, but then the feedback and the response uh, is felt within the community. And that helps my work get better. And it, it helps them uh, support the work. And it also uh, gives me that insurance that when I go somewhere else and someone sees this, that um, it's aligned with, with, uh, with, every, with, the, with the North itself. And if it's not, then I can say, this is my perspective. This is not the perspective of the community. This is the work that I'm doing. So I can right-size expectation and understanding. I'll show the last clip because I see that we've got seven minutes left. And this is just the outtakes. And this is the film crew that you'll see. And you'll see some of the kids. And you'll just see us having fun. But I just thought it might be nice to, to show just this last little clip.
TV, but it's different being here. The liver, and now they're going to the spleen. Makes you a little weepy just watching it. The young people are so much older now, and uh, there's the new generations added. And there were two that are gone now. Sarah, who's 90, she was the one that was going like this, and I was like trying to see where she was pointing. Uh, she's passed away. And Lulu, who was, um, she's had the giant Ulu, and she, gosh, she was so experienced with that Ulu. And I learned a lot just in that watching her. Uh, harvest that whale and uh, she's no longer with us either so just want to acknowledge those incredible knowledge keepers